Kristen Atchison here, and we're still talking about Chapter 13, The Chemical Senses, Perceiving Odors and Tastes. This is our second video lecture where we're going to talk about neurons, the brain, um, and some higher order processing as well um, within olfaction. So how the system works in terms of anatomical and neural basis, um, kind of let's start talking about from the nose to the brain. Again, you were assigned the, um, the crash course video um, that really does a good job of kind of walking through um, how the anatomical structure of both olfaction um, and gestation. Um, and what's nice is they, they put those two together really well too. So please make sure you're watching that. Um, it's very, very helpful, especially um, to, to walk you through these two systems. So here we're going to talk about the olfactory system. So basically, um, whatever is smelly, whether it's good smelly or bad smelly, um, is releasing molecules. Um, and those molecules are entering um, your nose through, um, in getting into those nasal cav cavities through those orthonasal pathways, okay? So we're smelling things. Um, you can see this here, those little blue and purple lines um, on this graph from this, or for this image from this, the flower um, are entering the nose, okay? And then the little red dotted lines are telling you kind of how it's getting to where it is. So again, these odorant molecules are being released from whatever is smelly, from the food, um, from the, you know, the liquid, from the whatever it is, um, is releasing little molecules of that thing. Um, and that is what you're smelling. Um, this is transduced um, into neural signals um, by olfactory receptor neurons. Now, we're not going to talk, um, your, and your book does, your book talks about all the different kinds um, of ORNs, those olfactory um, receptor neurons. We're not going to go into the different kinds of it. So it talks about um, different kinds. It talks about um, different structures involved in that. We're not going to go into that level of detail. So again, how it's being transduced is not going to be um, important to know, but that it is being transduced um, by these olfactory receptor neurons is important. So there are 350 different types of receptors for olfaction. So again, for vision, we have rods and cones um, for those receptive neurons. For olfactory, there are 350 different types of that. Um, because there's so many, each is sensitive to just one kind of stimulus. Um, so we would have, in terms of rods and cones, we would have, yeah, we're better at color here and we're better at light here, but they can each kind of do it as well. Um, and we talked about, you know, different sounds and um, different color receptors and all of those sorts of things. Here we really are just sensitive to one thing. Um, when you take the 350 different types of receptors we have um, and you multiply that by the number of each type we have, we end up having about 3 to 7 million um, olfactory receptor neurons. And where those olfactory receptor neurons are, um, is in this olfactory epithelium. Um, and so this is, you can see this here in um, the, little, the little neurons that are blue and purple and red in that olfactory epithelium. Um, and that's transducing that information and conveying that information up to the olfactory bulb. You don't need to know about the different kinds of cells that it's doing it with. Um, but again, what's important to know is that um, those olfactory receptive neurons are in that olfactory epithelium and it's being transferred into that olfactory bulb um, into the brain. How this works, how these different kinds um, of olfactory receptor neurons are sensitive to different things is again like this key and lock system. Um, so this image on the left, um, we have all these different molecules and that's what those little like Lego buildings look like at the bottom. Um, and they're only sensitive, um, each cilia is only sensitive to certain kinds because each olfactory receptive neuron is only sensitive. Um, so we're, it's the key and lock and they're going to match up. So the red match up with the red here, the green match up with the green here um, on these olfactory receptors. So again, we're only going to be set, each one's only going to be able to respond to one kind of stimuli. Um, so this is, this is the level of detail you need. Again, you do not need the information about the mitral cells or the tufted any of that. Um, just that, again, we have those olfactory receptor neurons in that olfactory epithelium, um, that that's transducing the information um, through each 
um, receptor is sensitive to a certain kind of, of odor molecule, and then that information is being transmitted to that olfactory bulb. We actually see that these olfactory receptor neurons themselves are ex exhibiting adaptation. Um, so they've done research with newts, um, and they've been able to see that that recovery is fairly rapid, um, and they can get that um, baseline back after about five seconds. Um, so they can actually see this adaptation that we talked about in lecture one on the neural level as well and through some studies with newts. So the odors get into the brain in that olfactory bulb. Here we see that that's that yellow bulb that's right there at the top of the nerve where those olfactory receptor neurons are. Um, and they travel to three different areas into the brain. The pitiform cortex, um, which is our primary olfactory cortex, the amygdala, and the entorhinal cortex. Now notice that all three of these locations are really deep inside the brain. If you remember back to the beginning of the course, we talked about kind of the evolution of the brain. And the brain started um, kind of deep, this, the oldest parts of our brain are deepest inside our brain. Um, and that it evolved kind of back and out um, so that our frontal cortex, our prefrontal cortex is the newest evolutionary part of our brain. So the, the system that we're dealing with here with the olfactory bulb, the pentaform cortex, the amygdala, and the entorhinal cortex are very, very old evolutionary brain systems, okay? So that's an important to remember, and we'll talk about that in just a second. So the pitiform cortex, the amygdala, and the entorhinal cortex send that information, that's all here, they send that information um, to the orbital frontal cortex, um, and that's that green area here. Um, all three of those locations send information to the orbital frontal cortex, and that's where the brain decides, is this a good smell or is this a bad smell? Um, they're going to decide whether this is a positive or negative stimulus. Now what's interesting is the amygdala and the entorhinal cortex also send additional information. Um, so the amygdala is going to send information, and this is what's involved with emotions, is going to send information to the hypothalamus, and the entorhinal cortex is going to send information to the hippocampus. Now notice none of these signals are going to the thalamus, which is different. All of our other um, senses sent information through the thalamus. The reason that it's not going through the thalamus, the, um, the theory is that it is because this is such an old evolutionary sense um, and that this system evolved before we had a thalamus. Um, and so this smell, again, remember smell is an early warning system um, and, a and a lot of animals have it um, and a lot of animals that are a lot more um, evolutionarily kind of simplistic have it. Um, so again, they, the idea is that this evolved before we had a thalamus. Um, and so that's why this is the sense that doesn't actually send information through the thalamus. So let's look at this a little bit closer. Um, so again, that olfactory um, bulb is sending information to these three places, the amygdala, the, the piriform cortex, and the entorhinal cortex. All three of those send things to that orbital frontal cortex, and that's that green block there. Now, the amygdala and the entorhinal cortex send two signals. They send the one to the orbital frontal cortex, but they each send additional signals. Um, again, that, some of that has to do with memory. Um, some of that has to do with emotion. And so they're sending additional information outside of just the orbital frontal cortex. Um, and again, this is information that's having to do with emotions, and this is information that has to do with memories. That leads us into these higher order processes. Um, we have a really big relationship between odor and memory. And some of that is because odor is a warning system. Um, so it's important to know what smells are dangerous um, so that as a, as a creature that we can avoid those dangerous stimuli. Um, so memories for odors are really, really long lasting. They're really, really rapidly formed and they are excellent triggers of emotion. So you can smell something that you perceive as pleasant and it can take you back to that situation that you first smelled it in and it can be highly linked to emotion. So your emotional state can switch on a dime um, by the presentation of an odor stimulus that's evoking memories. And it will bring back those memories um, and the emotions associated with them. And again, this is what's happening from those additional signals that the brain is sending out outside of just sending it to the orbital frontal cortex. 
we can recall odors um, that are recent better. So the things that have happened recently to us, we're gonna be able to remember those very, very well. Um, but we can actually do our very earliest kinds of memories very, very well as well. So there, um, and we'll talk about this on the next slide, there's a strong link um, between olfaction and memory. And again, this is due to that early evolutionary history. Um, and that's those direct links to the hypothalamus and the hippocampus. Again, we're not going through the thalamus. We're not, we're going straight to these memory and emotion sources. Um, and so they, they really think that this strong link that we have with memory and emotion is due to these direct signals, these more direct signals um, to the hypothalamus and the hippocampus. So they did a study where they took um, 60 to 80 year old individuals um, and they gave them, they divided them into three groups and they gave them one of three tasks. The first one is A, um, is just odors. Okay, so, you know, the vanilla or the aftershave or whatever the odor was, they just gave them the odors. And they got the best um, memories for the memories that were earliest like the most recent. So it was only, um, you know, it wasn't, the age wasn't that long ago. So you'll see for all three graphs, we have a pretty good recency effect where we, all of them kind of go up at the end. All of those graphs go up in the end for the 70 to 80 um, tick. And that's because of that recency effect we talked about in the previous slide. Now, what's really interesting though, is those really, really early memories. Let's talk like zero to 10, 11 to 20. Um, we, we were able to evoke a lot of information about those. We were, they were able to evoke the most information about those really early memories. Again, these are memories between zero and 10. And we're talking about um, individuals in their 80s. And they're being able to remember these things that were 70 years ago. Um, and again, they were able to do this with the odor. The other two groups, B and C, were either given um, words naming the odors. So instead of giving the odor vanilla, they would say vanilla, the smell of vanilla. They would give in those words and try and evoke those memories. Um, and the third group, C, was given pictures. So given pictures of vanilla. Um, and again, what they saw was that odor was evoking um, more memories um, than either words or pictures were of those same odors. So again, this olfactory system's direct link to the, the hypothalamus and the hippocampus is really enabling, the theory says, um, us to remember these things more directly. We also see this happening not only in terms of remembering things from long ago, but this is a system that's online before we're even born. Um, so they have prenatal um, memories evoked by odors. So fetuses um, begin and um, fetuses and embryos begin swallowing amniotic fluid at about 11 weeks. So very, very early on, um, they're swallowing the amniotic fluid that they're in, um, in their, their mother's womb. And, and this fluid changes depending on what mom's eating. Um, mom herself is going to have some flavors in her amniotic fluid. What she eats is going to change um, the flavors of her amniotic fluid. And what they do is then they test these babies after they're born. I mean, they give them two options. And these are all formula-fed babies. They give them two options. They give them the option of sm something that smells um, like their mother's amniotic fluid or something that smells like something new that's important to them, formula. And they prefer, um, both two-day-old and four-year-old, four-day-olds prefer the smell of the amniotic fluid. So not only do they prefer this familiar smell, they're remembering this smell um, from a previous situation. So again, this system is very, very early on um, that this, how important um, these smells are. And so again, um, both two day, and that's what the AF lines are, both two day olds and um, four day olds prefer amniotic fluid over that formula milk. I and mean, there's lots of other examples of this as well. The last thing that we're going to talk about in this lecture are pheromones. Is there evidence for human pheromones? Not really. Um, there's some um, evidence, but most of it really remains controversial, and there's very little information that really supports that humans have a pheromone system um, similar to other animals. 
There are systems in many other animals that really detect these pheromones, um, but the overall research with humans suggests that it's not a process that we have, it's not a system that we as humans have. Um, the research that does suggest that humans are emitting some sort of substances that can affect the behavior of other humans um, point out that these are probably actually due to other factors um, and not due to um, olfactory factors. Um, so that really there's not much evidence supporting a human pheromone system. So this ends our conversation about the neural signals, the anatomy, and um, the higher order processing of olfaction. Thanks.